You listen to me. Put the bunny back in the box. I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. Hello, 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 and welcome. This is Cage Unleashed, an unhinged podcast dedicated to the wild and wonderful filmography of Nicholas freaking Cage. I am your host, Lego, and today we're talking about the 1996 action-packed film directed by one Michael Bay in what I think is one of the most bay fiction of the Bay films, The Rock. And we're actually just a little bit past the something if anniversary. I didn't do the math, and I should have. What's twenty? What's twenty twenty three minus nineteen ninety six? I don't know. Um, twenty uh, twenty seven years. Yeah, twenty seven years. That's a good number, I guess. Um, so The Rock, yes, was released uh, June 7th, 1996, directed, as I said, by Michael Bay. It was produced by Jerry Brockheimer and Don Simpson. Unfortunately, Don Simpson did pass away during the filming of the movie. This is, I believe, Michael Bay's second film, his first being the 1995 film Bad Boys, which was pretty successful. So, you know, I guess it... It, it kind of, uh, you know, got him a pretty good launching pad for his career and to do this film, which also was very successful. Um, I don't know. Ever since uh, ever since Box Office Mojo was bought by IMDb, I kind of don't trust it as much, but it definitely made bad. Definitely, definitely, definitely made back its money for sure, um, if, if not very much so. So that's good. And in this movie, I mean, it has a cast. Sean Connery, Nick Cage, Ed Harris, Dave Morris, Michael Bean, Tony Todd, William Forsythe, Vanessa Marcel, uh, John C. McGinley, Gregory Sporleader. Uh, I don't think I pronounced that right. Claire Forlandi. Like, it's one of those movies that when you're watching it, you recognize... Even the background actors, it's it's one of those, oh, I know him, and oh, I know him, and oh, I know him kind of movies. I do like the tagline, which is Alcatraz. Only one man has ever broken out. Now five million lives depend on two men breaking in. <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny, I think. I guess this um, was one of those m- movies where the script had been kind of around for a while And I guess Michael Bay saw it and wanted to do it. Um, I don't think this movie is is really one of those movies that very much reflects the script that was written, which from my understanding was a lot more serious in nature. This movie had a lot of uh, improv and it did have uh, rewrites on behalf of Sean Connery, Nick Cage, and Head Harris, who all seemed to have gotten along on set. So it wasn't like, a, I want my character to be cooler than your character, like some of those um, family movies have. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to read the VHS description, because I just think that's fun. So, quote the VH that I found. Hollywood superstar Sean Connery joins Academy Award winner Nicolas Cage in the action-packed thriller of the year, The Rock. All of San Francisco is taken hostage when a vengeful general seizes control of Alcatraz Island, threatening to launch missiles loaded with a deadly poisonous gas. With time running out, only a young FBI chemical weapons expert and a notorious federal prisoner have the skills to penetrate the island fortress and defuse the lethal situation. Edge of your seat suspense and unstoppable action explode off the screen in this must-see motion picture event. I do agree with that. It absolutely is a motion picture event. I could not imagine seeing this in theaters. It must have been an experience. All right, so I'm going to get into the plot and funny commentary because that's just kind of what I'm here for. 
I did not take 16 pages of notes. Um, I took nine pages of notes. Ten, I took ten pages of notes. So, this is tight. All right. The film opens on a military funeral with voiceover of Ed Harris and some other characters trying to get these guys uh, cleared off the field. And I'm assuming it is some sort of military operation in which these gentlemen died and Ed Harris' character lived. We also then see him at a gravesite leaving flowers for someone named Barb, who I assume is either his spouse or partner of some form. Um, I'm not sure. I'm assuming she was also in the military because it seems like she was buried. She had a military burial. I, I don't know. It was a little muddled. Don't quite know. We do very much learn what Ed Harris' character, General Francis X. Hummel, we do learn very much what he um, is 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 doing and the reason why he's doing it. There's uh there's no we we don't necessarily get well we get backstory, but they give us really good motivation. We don't have to guess. It's, it's very overt, but I'll get there in a few minutes. All right. So it's um uh, nighttime, it's a raining sequence and we see a team of rogue marines stealing these kind of green orbs that hold a highly volatile poison, which we'll learn later is VX gas. So these, one of the green orbs is dropped and breaks and kills one of the Marines in under a minute. And what I gotta say is a pretty gnarly makeup job. I didn't look to see who did the makeup, but I really believe that guy was dying in a, in a really painful and awful way. He gets locked in a room by Major Tom Baxter, played by David Moros. And he apologizes to the to the Marine for leaving him there to die. But it was kind of a it's just you or it's all of us situation because again, this is very, very volatile uh poisonous gas we're dealing with. And he does seem generally remorseful that he, he didn't want any sort of unnecessary death on this mission. And this scene is really important. Because it does show how far these Marines are going to be willing to go to get what they want. And it also very much shows us how dangerous and deadly this VX gas is. Which is something I think you really need to convey to your audience. And I do love that we not only get this in terms of exposition. But for this scene, we get it visually so. And I think doubling up on that is really, really good filmmaking. I know a lot of people make fun of Michael Bay, but this is very good filmmaking. Then, uh, you know, we we go, we learn, we come to know that they get a number of rockets that are going to be armed with this VX gas. So we cut to Nicolas Cage character, and he's playing FBI agent Dr. Stanley Goodspeed, which is just a great name that's that's just that's fantastic a plus name he's he's in a suit and he's playing with like a nerf dart gun in a chemical lab so we learn he has good aim which is fun we also learn that he won five dollars from his trainee marvin for shooting the dart into a beaker which doesn't seem like it's a safe thing to do but okay um they have an elaborate setup like they're not dominoes but they're kind of like dominoes in their position so they all kind of fall around and they you know hit this little lever and it causes the the fire to like you i think we've all had like science class where they have those like little flamey stations flamey stations is a thing it, you know what i'm talking about and it causes the lever to turn so the fire goes up and it, it burns a hula girl, like, you know, one of those little wobbly action figurines that's like a hula dancer. Again, this doesn't seem like it is in line with any kind of safety protocol, but all right. Another doctor, Dr. Phil, enters the room saying, what I was thinking the whole time, you guys have way too much time on your hands. And he brings good speed of package that he's very excited for. Apparently, he spent $600 
on an LP. If you don't know, LP is a record. Um, the record specifically is Meet the Beatles, and he is a self-described Beatle maniac. And he had it sent to his work instead of his home because his girlfriend, Carla, wouldn't approve of him spending $600 on a record. I gotta say, I'm with Carla. That's ridiculous. Clearly, this man is very pretentious and also has $600 of disposable income. So that's, you know, I don't know what that says about him. It really isn't important to the character. I don't know. I don't know why that wasn't cut. But all right, moving on. So some alarms start going off in the lab. Nick Cage and company, I'm henceforth going to be calling him Goodspeed. Uh, I'll go to see what's up. But there was a crate package, like a like a wooden crate addressed to Bos a Bosnian refugee camp um, that was found at uh, JFK, which if you don't know is a airport in New York and a bomb sniffing dog alerted them that there might be what they suspect is a sarin gas in the crate. So Goodspeed and Marvin suit up in these fancy like silver looking hazmat suits and go in to investigate the package, uh, which does in fact have sarin gas in a really creepy looking uh, baby doll. Um, that was unnecessary, kind of killed my soul. It's fine. So anyway, it dispersed in this like um, aerosol kind of situation. So the gas like um, spread out of the baby's mouth and it's apparently very corrosive and starts eating through their suits. It kills a bunch of cockroaches. Um, dude, if it kills cockroaches, you know it's deadly because like nothing kills a cockroach. They can survive in a refrigerator. How is that even possible? I just don't understand. Anyway, yes, it definitely conveys how dangerous this is. And there's also a bomb in the doll, which could blow up the building that they're in. I don't know what building they're in. I don't recall. So the uh, Goodspeed is able to defuse the bomb while remaining relatively calm, I would say, while Marvin in juxtaposition is freaking the F out. The guys on the outside who are trying to get some sprinklers to go off are trying to keep Marvin calm. Um, but they need to take this antidote for the gas, which is in a syringe. Um, it's atropine. atropine. Um, it's in a syringe that they have to inject into their heart. Marvin completely refuses. He's like, I, I can't, I can't stick this in my heart. I'm with Marvin. Um, I think he's the smartest man in the room. But anyway, Goodspeed is able to defuse the bomb without having to inject himself with the atropine. Would you think they'd still have to? Because he was, if it, if the material is corrosive to his suit, wouldn't he have still been affected by the gas? You know what? It's a Banco Bay movie. I don't know why I'm trying to use logic. Moving on. <laughs> so we cut to Goodspeed playing guitar in his... At first I thought he was in his underwear, but when I was reading the... I was reading the, you know, the information on IMDb, like the trivia, it said he was actually completely in the nude playing his guitar. Oh, that's interesting. And he's listening to his Beatles LP and his girlfriend Carla comes home. And I really, really, really love their exchange um good sweet says i mean honey the world is being fedex to hell on a handcart and i really believe anyone who's even thinking about having a child in this rule is coldly considering an act of cruelty to which kyla replies i'm pregnant <laughs> and Goodspeed is mm, kind of mortified and uh, after they they confirm she is in fact definitely pregnant she asks uh, you know um you didn't mean what you said, did you? He said, well, I meant it at the time. At the time, you said it seven and a half seconds ago. Well, gosh, kind of what's happened since then. I just think they're, you know, they're really cute. And uh, eventually they, you know, have some conversations and decide that they, in fact, should get married. And they do love each other. And it is really quite sweet. So when we cut back to Alcatraz for a tour guide of The Rock. So I guess Alcatraz is called The Rock. I do feel like maybe they should have made that a little bit more obvious. I mean, it is obvious, but they could have made it a little more so, like, during the tour. So, anyway, the tour is led by Ranger Bob, played by Raymond O'Connor, who is just kind of does bit parts in so many things. You'll probably recognize him. And he was doing such a fun job as the tour guide. I love Ranger Bob. So... He gets out some, you know, much needed exposition in in regards to information about the rock or Alcatraz. So he says no one has ever escaped from when it was opened in 1936 to 1963. And in this, 
tour guide, we see our Marines, you know, Hummel and uh, Baxter, a part of the group. And we see some of the others go already kind of going inside and starting to take over. We do see Hummel ask a group of kids to go back, you know, on the boat and leave. So it kind of shows that he's not such a bad guy. He really doesn't want to kill anyone. He, he really legitimately out there trying to do, you know, he's doing something bad, but you're going to kind of agree with, with why he's doing it. Uh, more so than most movie villains, in, in my opinion. So the tourists go to the cells or into the cells as part of the tour. And at that moment, the Marines take over and poor Bob is shoved into a cell himself. So they now have 81 civilian hostages. So more Marines show up on helicopters, which I got to say, how? Like, how did they get away with stealing those helicopters? I'm very confused by that, but all right. So Hummel goes through this whole long speech, which is honestly really well done on the part of Ed Harris. I love Ed Harris' character in this. And so basically he's saying we're in harm's way. He, you know, points to Baxter that they have been working together since 1968. Um, him and Hendrix and Crisp have been around working together for a very long time um, since... Desert Storm and Captain Fry and Daryl are new. Um, and we're going to learn later they're assholes, uh, but they have a reputation. And, you know, he makes it clear that we've achieved our position through poise, position, and audacity. To this, we must now add resolve. We will be branded as traitors, the gravest capital crime punishable by death. Uh, then he kind of compares them all to Washington, Jefferson, and Adams, that they were branded as traitors by the British, but, you know, now they're called patriots, and in time, so shall we, God willing. Um, they have the VX gas warheads, and that they're going to leave to a non-extradition treaty country, each with a fee of $1 million for services rendered. I think that's really important, and it comes back a bit later and I have a lot to say about that. We'll get there then, though. Um, so uh, the Marines are uh, the Marine Force Retcon are select to carry out illegal operations throughout the world. When they don't come home, their families are told fairy tales that of what happened to them and denied compensation. Well, I have choked on these lies my entire career. Well, here's where here and now these lies stop. So basically what he wants is compensation. And we get more into that later when he talks to the FBI. But he basically just wants, you know, he wants the families for these people that he's worked with who died to get compensation, which is honestly fair. Like this movie ends up being like very anti-government, pro-military, which I think a lot of people can kind of agree with. And $1 million, it's so low. Like, the fact that these, you know, special, super special Marines are willing to turn their backs on the United States, who they vowed to protect, um, for a single $1 million is kind of scary. Like, I don't know, man. $100 million, sure, I get it. One? One million? That's it? Dude, that's wild. So we cut back to Washington, D.C., where we meet the FBI director, Womack, which I did think it was really weird because they showed a picture of, like, the Capitol building and the Washington Monument, which is the mall, which is not where FBI headquarters is. It's, um, it is in Washington, D.C., but, like, that, that, that's, it's not on the mall. I just thought it was really weird that they did that. I guess it's one of those things, like, if you're, if, if you're familiar with the area, you know it's wrong, but most people aren't familiar with the area and don't care. So it... I guess it's fine. It's just a little lazy. I don't know. So um, Hummel calls Womack, which is kind of weird. Like, how did you know? How did he know, like, where Womack was? This is nighttime. Like, why did he think he would still be in the office? And how did he get his number? I have many, many, many follow-up questions to how he got Womack's number. But anyway, he just gets a direct call to the, you know, uh, head of the FBI um, and he says that he'll call back later with their demands. So then we cut to the Pentagon, which 
it just it does actually show a picture of the Pentagon, so I guess that's fine. And uh, which you don't know is just in in Virginia, so it's not that far of a drive from DC. Um, so we have a boardroom full of men going over Hummel's service record, and he is a very decorated Marine. And then Hummel calls them again. How did he know he they were there? How did he get that number? Many questions. It's fine. It's annoying, but it's fine. So he states his demands. He says that 83 force reconnaissance Marines have died right under my various commands. 47 in northern Laos and southern China. And um, ones in, in Desert Storm were basically left to rot. Um, one of the younger men says, we didn't send troops to southern China. I believe it was Sinclair, who's the... Um, the oh shoot he's a chief of something he's on the the president's staff so but it was so funny because the guy is like how old are you he's like 33 first of all no 33 year old's gonna be in that position but whatever it's fine but Hummel basically dismisses him and he's like put someone put some tape over that man's mouth and put someone older on the phone <laughs> um he's very no nonsense and so then, yeah, so um, a bunch of people were left to rot in Baghdad after the conflict was ended. No benefits were paid to their families. No medals conferred. These men died for their countries, and they weren't even given a goddamn military burial. The situation is unacce unacceptable. And you agree. Like, that is unacceptable. That's awful. That's it. Like, like what he's saying is totally right. Uh, so anyway, his demand is you will transfer $100 million into the, uh, from the Grand Cayman Red Sea Trading Company account into the account that I designate. From these funds, reparations of $1 million will be paid to each of the 83 Marines' families. The rest of the funds I will disperse at my discretion. So this is the thing where it does come back where, you know, you kind of can get behind it, but then also kind of not. Because it's like, so you really only care about those 83 Marines that you work with? Because I guarantee you there are a lot of other ones who have probably had similar situations and didn't get jack shit. So, like, wouldn't you want something bigger? Honestly, he probably could have just gone to to a, a news station with this information. Because he seems like he knows a lot. Like, a lot about, you know, all these secret things that we're going to I'll get right back to with the uh, Grand Cayman Red Sea Trading Company account. Like, he knows a lot. And he's not dumb. And he could have just, you know, given this information to the news and had them published it. And, like, and, and then gotten, you know, probably a lot more done in terms of, like, making sure that those 83 people, you know, got those reimbursements. Or their families got these reimbursements. He didn't have to do this. It's honestly kind of dumb that he did. Anyway, so uh, Womack asks what the Red Sea account is, and he replies that it's a slush fund where the Pentagon keeps proceeds from illegal arms sales. <laughs> and a couple of the guys in the in the Pentagon are like, oh, shit, stop telling people things. Uh, oh, my gosh. And so I, it, it, what this scene is very important is that it shows Hummel clearly knows what he's talking about. He knows quite a lot of government secrets and highly classified information. And the dudes in the Pentagon, this boardroom, are kind of afraid of what he has to say. So anyway, Hummel gives them 40 hours to to set up this um this one million uh, this 100 million dollars and i think it's really good that they give us kind of a ticking clock which as we all know is a phenomenal way to build suspense when we have you know a countdown uh michael bay does that a lot but you know again it's it's good and i do think it's used very effectively here so the potential casualty rate is you know what they start talking about in this pentagon boardroom where we learn that VA, VX gas uh, can kill 60 or 70,000 people. If a teaspoon hits the floor, it's lethal up to 100 feet. If a teaspoon is detonated in the atmosphere, it will kill every living organism in an eight block radius, which would make it one of the most lethal things on the planet. Like, that's crazy that these Marines were able to steal that. <laughs> that's actually frightening. So, um, later, there is a countermeasure in its testing phase it's not yet operational and Hummel knows that 
So the countermeasure is something called thermite plasma. Which I don't know what that is. I don't know what it does. And the movie doesn't explain it. But they do start to try to uh, load some F-18s with said thermite plasma um, in the 36 hours, which give them a plan B if their plan A fails. So we learn from Womack that the best chemical biological man is Stanley Goodspeed, of course. So Stanley gets a call saying he needs to go to San Francisco. And Carla decides to go uh, fly out later and meet him there. Which kind of doesn't make any sense, but we need to do it for the plot. So, okay. <laughs> for the plot. We then get introduced back in the Pentagon courtroom to Commander Anderson, played by Michael Bean. And he is filling the Pentagon boardroom in on his plan of action, which is, I would think, pretty good. They, I don't know, they really had to go out of their way to make it make sense for Sean Connery's character to be necessary for the film. But, you know what? Why not? Why not? I mean, architect? Who knows? Who cares? People who work in Alcatraz, they don't know uh, how to break out or break in. Why would they? It's not like they know the landscape. <sighs> So, um, two old men argue about something in secret, Womack, and I forgot who the other guy was. And uh, they did something like 33 years ago, but they don't want people to know because either it does or it doesn't exist. So, this is where we learn about Sean Conner Connery's character, John Patrick Mason, a.k.a. definitely not James Bond. Definitely not James Bond. He was a highly trained SAS operative so basically he was pretty much what the marines are uh is basically what he was but for britain um so he <laughs> so how he broke out of um alcatraz uh goodspeed says this later on but i just thought it was really funny so he broke out of his cell he went down an incinerator chute on a mine car through tunnels to a power plant under the steam engine, which was really cool, by the way, and into the cistern through the intake pipe. And then he waited three days for the tides to be right to swim back to shore. That's amazing. I don't know how far of a swim that is, but it's it's pretty amazing. And the cell break with the sheets is pretty dang cool. <laughs> For sure. So Womack and Goodspeed meet. Oh my god. Goodspeed is such a nerd. He's so awkward. I, I love it. But it's also. You, it's one of those. You're kind of embarrassed for him sometimes. When he opens his mouth. <laughs> oh man. Uh, but uh, he meets. Um, or they meet at an airplane. Going to San Francisco. And he realizes slowly. And to his horror. This is not a training exercise. The FBI sets up a mobile command center on Pier 39. Don't know why that's important, but I wrote it down. Mason was incarcerated in Alcatraz in 1962, and obviously he broke out in 1963, as I said. And he's, he's, at first I kind of wondered if he was that secret. Why did they keep on Alcatraz? But that was a military and federal prison. But it, I don't know, I feel like they have a more secret prison. I don't know why I'm thinking of like that prison in Arrow on the island, but that's what my mind goes to. Just something a little bit more secretive than just Alcatraz, which given I grew up in an age where Alcatraz is like the most famous prison ever, but whatever. Um, so I don't really know why Goodspeed is in the room while he's being interrogated, but he is. So Paxton, who's played by William Forsyth, who's a really great character and has a fantastic mustache, goes in to interrogate Mason First, and he really doesn't get anywhere. Then they send in Goodspeed for some odd reason. And okay, Stanley is not a good liar. Like he's adorable and it's kind of sad. <laughs> he's just like bumbling genius energy. He can't even get his qualifications right. He's like, I'm good Agent Goodspeed from the uh, federal <laughs> well, from the FBI. <laughs> and the guys in the in watching the interrogation are like, Jesus, unless he got at least he got his name right, which is, it's just so funny. So Goodspeed goes in and gives Mason everything he wants. Gets him a coffee, gets his handcuffs taken off, 
he does get him to sign the uh, agreement that he'll help them in exchange for getting a release. He even agrees to get him set up in a room with the Fairmont and a haircut. He's even recommending a haircut to him. <laughs> Honey, stop. 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 He doesn't. Womack uh, tears up the agreement when they let um, uh, to let Mason out, which is very legal and good speeds in total despair because he gave Mason his word. Like he's very he's very honest, which is sweet. And as we watch the film, we also learn that he doesn't use profanity, which I think is kind of cute. So he has some great lines like Zeus's butthole. <laughs> Gee whiz, gosh, yeah, he's just like kind of adorable, bumbling genius. So Paxton gives Mason a quarter because he's being really rude. And Mason then uses the quarter to break the two-way window. And he sees it's a Womack and they have a stare down. Like they have, they have some, some beef, shall we say. Um, Mason gets his room at the Fairmont and he gets his hair cut. And shout out to that hairstylist. He, he gave a great performance for sure. And he does get Mason cleaned up. He looks quite nice. Uh, Goodspeed gets a gun. <laughs> and, and they're kind of, everyone's kind of making fun of poor Goodspeed. Like, have you fired one of those since you were in the Academy? He probably hasn't. Oh man, Goodspeed. Goodspeed's a hero, damn it. You just don't know it yet. So Mason gets the upper hand on Womack. And Goodspeed pulls his gun and asks Mason, please don't. That'd be me. I'm like, please don't make me do anything. Um, Mason sends uh, Womack over the the railing of a multi-story building. I don't know what floor they're on. Uh, and Goodspeed has to go running after him. I think realistically, Womack's arm at the very least would be dislocated because he's hanging by a sing by like some string by just his arm. That just oh god, that looks so painful. Uh, Mason steals a Humvee, which is really sad, I think, because clearly the owner of this Humvee, like, that's his prized possession. And Goodspeed steals a yellow sports car, which I thought was a Mustang, but turns out it's a Ferrari, and goes in on a pursuit. And I'm watching this, and it's very clear that this soundtrack is Hans Zimmer. And honestly, it sounds... If you've watched this back-to-back -back with Twister which also came out in 1996, which was also the music was done by Hans Zimmer. They sound so similar. It's legitimately crazy. I feel like Hans Zimmer like, is so talented, but he's a little lazy in 96. I mean, I get it, but it's funny. Um, and I'm never going to be able to unhear some of these action sequences when I watch this movie. And I'll just be thinking about Twister. I love Twister. Anyway, um, so the Humvee owner calls Mason on the car phone, which I don't know how popular that was in 1996. That would make a great feature, totally. So, yeah, he calls him on the car phone and tries to get his Humvee back. But then Mason uses the car phone to track down his daughter, Jade, is played by uh, Claire Forlani, who you might know from Mallrats. I think that's really the only thing I've ever seen her in, other than this. Uh, there's this... Um, high speed car chase in downtown San Francisco where they were able to get up to 70 miles per hour, which if you've ever been to San Francisco, my only question to that is fucking how <laughs> ridiculous. Anyway, sure. Movie. Um, they, they just destroy so much. They destroy so much. It's insane. Uh, good speed just obliterates that Ferrari and hits a trolley again. Got a shout out the tro trolley driver. That actor gave a 30 second performance of a lifetime. Amazing. <laughs> um, Goodspeed ends up finding out about Jade and he meets up with, um, he, or he winds up following Jade and through Jade finds Mason. He lets them talk and we learned that <laughs> Uh, at one point, so Mason is working at a, a couple prisons, at least two. And apparently, um, he was out for a while before they captured him again. So he he had escaped a prison, went to a Led Zeppelin concert, hooked up with uh, Jade's mom, hence Jade, and before he was arrested again. And I just, that's a wild move, sir. And I respect it. <laughs> but we also find out that Jade doesn't really know much about her father, which is kind of unfortunate. But he really wants to get to know her, which is, I think, really sweet. 
Um, so Goodspeed comes up and says, gee whiz, and covers for Mason, even though he is physically vibrating with anger. It is like Nick Cage's performance in that movie or in that moment is honestly one relatable two hilarious. And then after, you know, Jade gets moved away and he's able to get Mason, he's like, what do you say? We cut the chit chat a hole. Uh, Just again, that subtle anger, which I really like that Nick Cage does really, 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 really well. And further, I gotta say, I, 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 I don't know the the move to have him not cuss uh, was Nick Cage's idea, and I, I do think it brings a lot to the character, even though it's very, very subtle. Yeah, I do agree. You know, everything Sean Connery is doing in this film is very Bond. It is. It just is. So uh, Mason pretends not to remember the schematics for Alcatraz. That way he'll have to go to Alcatraz with them. That way he can kind of break free. Um, Obviously, he's not going to be able to do that because of the whole threat to the entire area. Um, But yeah, whatever. Um, But I I, I think it's funny. So Commander Anderson overrides Womack. And uh, Mason is going, but he does threaten him that if he jeopardizes his men, he'll kill him. Uh, I really, I love Michael Bean's character in this. I mean, obviously Terminator is probably going to be my most people's favorite movie that he's in. Aliens is amazing, but I think he gives a really underrated performance in this film. He's not in it very long, but he really makes an impact, and Michael Bean's awesome. Okay, so that said that <laughs> very fast. Uh, Goodspeed realizes not is this not only is this not a training exercise, but also he's going to have to go into the field. <laughs> He's going to get a gun and a wetsuit, as Womack says. And it's so funny. His reaction to this is just to kind of nod, slowly comprehend, walk into the bathroom and puke. Honestly, good speed, same. Same. So same. Uh, Paxton kind of offers to have someone go get Carla, pick her up from the airport, and take her to Pier 39 for the, we're, with the rest of the mobile command center. Um, that way, good speed can, you know, worry about her a little less and keep his head in the mission. Anderson fills a team, which um, his team are Navy SEALs, in um, uh, Goodspeed and Mason in on their mission, and they go to the rock. They title drop quite a few times. Um, Goodspeed apparently is a bad swimmer, which I just think is funny. I kind of can't get a, a, a handle on his his abilities at times because Nick Cage is, as Goodspeed, is... I mean, he's doing a lot in terms of action that it's like, I mean, honestly, I couldn't do that. Like, no way someone who's just like a lab rat could just do that. Like, that takes some level of physicality. Um, But then there's stuff where it's like, I think he's afraid of needles and he's not a good swimmer. And it's like, so what can he and can he not do? Kind of, I don't know. It's a little muddled at times, but it's not that big of a deal. Because the exposition kind of helps with it. Um, I also love that Goodspeed's telling people stuff that he's heard, um, like his bosses say. For instance, uh, it's need to know and you don't need to know. Or it's classified. I just think it's really funny. Like he's hearing people who are kind of like cooler than him and just repeating what they're saying. Uh, I I like that quite a bit. It's just kind of another funny one of his quirks. Uh, So uh, Mason keeps his word. And shows Anderson and the team to Alcatraz, which I like. He does seem like he's not a bad guy, like, at all. Um, Then we finally return to Hummel and his men for, like, the first time in, like, 45 minutes. This is a very long movie, and it was a really long stretch to not see them. And I do think it's interesting that we never cut back after, um, at this point. Like, we never cut back to the people who are being held hostage, and I do think we should have. Um, again, this is a long movie, though. <laughs> Maybe cut out one of the 25,000 action sequences. But who am I? Really, who am I? I don't know anything. Um, so we return to Hamona's men. And they realize they have visitors. And thus we get the shower room scene. Hamona and his men have the high ground. And as Star Wars taught me, if it taught me nothing else, the high ground wins. I mean, for fuck's sake... Paxton even says it's a trap. 
Um, Hummel and Anderson are talking. Hummel gives him a chance to drop their weapons. Anderson is respectful. And he even says that he agrees with Hummel's, like, the reasoning behind his demands. But he swore to defend this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And you know goddamn well I can't give that order. You give that order. I cannot give that order. Oh, man. Ed Harris and Michael Bean in that moment were a fire. Uh, Hummel points out that uh, they are covered from the elevated position. They did that both. Four Star Wars. Oh, man. That's hilarious. Um, so Hummel, yeah, points out that they have the elevated position and no one has to die. Hummel really doesn't want to kill anyone. He really, really, really doesn't. Um, and honestly, Anderson should have given that order because there was no way that they weren't going to die with, with their positioning. Um, but he doesn't. And there is a shootout and all of the Navy SEALs are killed. And none of the Marines were. So basically, good guys lost, bad guys won. Um, yeah, it's kind of dumb dialogue. But again, Ed Harris and Michael Bean were going off. And it was fantastic. One of the, the Navy SEALs, kind of the youngest one, he was with Mason and Goodspeed. But then he heard the, the gun firing um, going off. So he goes up to help and he's killed. And he falls through this kind of like, I don't know, this like, it kind of looks like a sewer ladder, like the kind of like tunnels. Um, and he falls back to uh, where Goodspeed and Mason are. And Goodspeed looks horrified. Um, Mason grabs the radio and they, they take off. Hummel is clearly really upset that the the men um, and the men on on Pier 39 at the command center, they find Eagle 11 and 12 are still alive. Eagle 11 and 12 are Mason and Goodspeed. So there is still kind of a, a chance that they can they can pull through and disarm these VX gas rockets. I, at this point, I literally wrote in my notes, oh my god, this is the exact same plot as Armageddon. It's the exact same fucking movie, just in a different place. And I love both of these. <laughs> um, although, I'm just saying, Armageddon with Sean Connery and Nick Cage would have been cool. Moving on. Um, Mason goes wants to leave the island and Paxton is trying to get Goodspeed on the radio and he tells him to go get Mason back. Goodspeed's like, he has a gun. Paxton's like, bro, what do you have? Not what he said. And he's like, what do you have? Um, so uh, they kind of face off against each other. I love Goodspeed's like, FBI, freeze, sucker. <laughs> he's such a nerd. I love him so much. Mason takes his gun, and then Goodspeed has to tell Paxton he has all the guns now, sir. I feel so bad for Paxton. This this trained, you know, military guy who is is just doing his his best, trying to save San Francisco, and he's 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 getting half information from Womack. He he's just getting screwed. He's getting screwed. It's it's unfortunate. Hummel feels really bad, and Darrow suggests executing a hostage. Like, bro, what the fuck? Um, then uh, uh, Womack and Matt Paxton have a conversation about what it was that Mason did, and Womack fills Paxton on, finally, that he's a British operative who stole J. Edgar Hoover's microfilm files with all of the United States' big secrets, which are now, like, 30 years old, it wouldn't really be that big of a deal. Anyone who ordered any of those missions is dead by now. Like, who cares? <sighs> but whatever. Anyway, um, Mason returns Goodspeed's gun and asks if he's ready to go because he realizes, you know, how dire the situation is after Goodspeed tells him, um, you know, about the gas rockets. This is so funny. Uh, Goodsby says he'll do his best. Mason replies, your best. Losers always whine about their bests. Winner, go home and fuck the prom queen. Goodsby has, this is a line, guys. This is a line. Carla was the prom queen. Oh. <laughs> it's so funny. There's another shootout. Yet another big action scene. It begins. Uh, Mason and one of the Marines next to a rocket. Poor Goodspeed is stressed because they're firing very, very close to the rocket. 
Mason ends up firing high at this, like, it looks like an HVAC that's hanging from the ceiling. Um, it's, it's a big metal thing. And it falls, crushing the Marine. Um, good speed comments. Yeah, well, uh, okay. That's just about the most awful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and then good speed defuses the bomb. Yes, it's, um, he tells Mason, like, what the VX gas does. Um, okay, it's a clone some eh, it's an inhib innovator it stops the brain from sending nerve messages down the spinal cord within 30 seconds any epidermal exposure or inhal inhalation and you'll know a twinge at the small of your back as the poison gas Oh, seizes your nervous system. Your muscles freeze. You can't breathe. You spasm so hard that you break your own back and spit out your guts. But that's after your skin melts off. Jesus. That's intense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so they, yeah, they, they do the rocket. They defuse the rocket. And then they run as more Marines show up. They go on this, like, I don't know what these are called. I called it a little roller coaster thingy, but you know, like in mines, how they have those those carts on like train tracks? They're on those. And then they end up on um, overhead hanging ones. And another action sequence people are firing and people. Poor Mason is too old for doing all this. <laughs> and finally, Goodspeed ends up having to shoot and kill a Marine. And this is the first time we see him kill someone. Back to the Pentagon boardroom. Minecraft, yeah. That's that's basically what it is. So we cut back to the Pentagon boardroom where they agree on a go-ahead for Plan B, which, if you recall, is the thermite plasma, which is getting armed on um, some F-18s. If you don't know, it actually takes quite a while to to do that. So, um, you know, they, you have to... You definitely have to know you're going to want to do that. Ahead of time. So Mason turns himself into Hummel to ensure that Goodspeed can still get to the rockets and that a civilian will not be executed, which is what they were threatening to do. Uh, while Goodspeed is disarming another VX gas missile warhead thingy, he gets dropped in on by some bad Marines, which seems very unsafe because they like startle him while he's holding the green orbs. And given we know how dangerous those are, I would have waited till he sat those down. Personally, you know, but who am I? Um, a fight ensues again, and yeah, they honestly could have dropped a few of these action scenes, and it still would have been a movie that went real hard on action. Um, Mason and Hummel are talking. I, I like, I love Sean Connery and Ed Harris. It's it's so great. Um, Mason basically says, "This is not combat. This is an act of lunacy." I personally think you're a fucking idiot. Patriotism is a virtue of the vicious. Oscar Wilde. I love that he quotes Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde's the best. Go read Oscar Wilde. Mason and Goodspeed end up getting captured and both and locked in cells. Mason gets them out. I love the what in the name or how in the name of Seuss's butthole did you get out of your cell? It's so funny. And I love that Goodspeed is just lying on the floor lamenting about like how basically this is just a bunch of little kids with too much testosterone and he doesn't like, um, he doesn't like field guys. <laughs> so funny. And then um, all while, you know, uh, Mason is making tying sheets together to make this kind of cool like thing to catch the lever to open the cell. So fun. So ingenious, like a really smart dude. Uh, and then we, Realize we have two operational rockets left, I think. And Mason uh, tries to leave again. <sighs> Bro. We're down to three minutes left before the 40-hour the deadline. And we have Fry and Darrow are really ready to fire those rockets. Um, the Pentagon guys, I think Rorma calls back. And asks for another hour, which they're denied. We have our thermite plasma getting loaded onto the F-18s. Goodspeed returns to find the last rocket while Mason continues to try to leave, but does end up returning to save Goodspeed, who is being held at gunpoint. Hummel and the Bad Marines um, 
arm one of the the rockets and fire, but they send it into the ocean. Man, Darrow is pissed. Um, Bas- Baxter asks him to step outside so he can talk to Hummel. And even Baxter is kind of angry um, and he wants a new deadline. We get to see President, who is played by Stanley Anderson, who is also the president at Armageddon, and approves a missile strike. And I got, which is the thermite plasma, which I do wish they would have explained what exactly the thermite plasma will do. I, I think that we did need a little exposition on that front. Um, because, like, how does it differentiate between, like, a nuclear bomb? Or how does it differentiate between napalm? You know, all these things. Like, what what exactly is a thermite plasma? I don't know. Uh, so, Goodspeed and Mason are spying in on the situation between Hummel and Baxter. Well, we have Fry and Darrow come back in, and they want they want the money. They aren't Marines anymore. Yeah, they're mercenaries, and mercenary gets paid. Hummel replies, "We bluffed. They called it. The mission's over." Hummel's really at this point lost control of the men, and it is a very tense moment. So, <clears throat> Hendrix or nope, Darrow and Fry pull guns on Hummel, who has a gun on Crisp. Baxter is either with them or against them. So Baxter shoots Darrow. Hummel shoots Crisp. Fry and Darrow shoot Baxter and Hummel. Mason starts firing into the room at Fry and Darrow, who are dive out of the room. Goodspeed pulls Hummel out of the room as bullets are still firing. Hummel tells Goodspeed that the last rocket is in the lighthouse. (sighs) Okay, so Hummel gets to the, I'm sorry, nope, Goodspeed gets to the lighthouse and gets the VX gas out of the rocket. Hummel arrives and Goodspeed launches the rocket, which is now not armed um, with the gas any longer at him, killing him, (laughs) saying, it's you, you're the rocket man, in reference to the song, which did play earlier in the film, and I just realized that, and I just got the joke, and it's very funny. (laughs) I'm slow sometimes. Um, Fry uh, gets in as Goodspeed drops one of the VX gas orbs. Uh, he didn't break it. He just dropped the orb. It was rolling and he caught it. There's a chase scene. Uh, Fry chasing Goodspeed while shooting at him. Which, again, considering how lethal we know just a table or teaspoon of this gas is, that's really stupid in two ways. Um, Mason shoots... And, or No, he doesn't. Mason stops, rather, a sharpshooter from killing Goodspeed. He came back to, again, help him. We have our five F-18s who are on their way to Alcatraz, armed with the thermite plasma. Fry and Goodspeed continue their fight. Goodspeed shoves the V-8 gas orb into, into Fry's mouth while he's kind of straddling him and then punches him in the mouth, therefore breaking the orb in his mouth, and it causes him to die very violently. Poor Goodspeed has to come out with the the antidote, the antropine, and stab himself in the heart with this giant needle. The F-18s are still on their way, and it's in this moment that Goodspeed remembers uh, the conversation that, uh, well, the the information that Commander Anderson, Michael Bean's character, had given them in that if the the threat is neutralized, they need to go out and light um, green flares to so that the people on Pier 39 will see the green flares and know that they, they're safe and then wait for the all clear. Um, so he goes out with the green flares, falls to his knees, and waves them in the air in something that really is reminiscent purposefully of what, my, um, of what Matt Modine did in the film Birdie, uh, which Nick Cage was also in. Great movie. Uh, we'll be reviewing it sooner or later. Um, so they get the all clear. Uh, it is unfortunately just a teeny tiny bit too late as one of the pilots already dropped the thermite plasma. Luckily for Goodspeed and Mason, he dropped it on a part of the island they were not on. So Goodspeed lies and tells Paxton that Mason was vaporized. Paxton goes along with this lie to Womack, who totally buys it, therefore allowing Womack to again escape and be a free man for the first time really in 33 years and mason tells goodspeed where the microfilm is he and carla the last you know bit of the film is him and carla going out and uh to where where it is i think it's in kansas a church in kansas and they uh and i love it it's um hey honey 
You want to know who really killed JFK? And that's where the movie ends. My only thing is I do wish that, again, that we got to see the, the hostages one last time, getting taken off and seeing them taken to safety. That's really the only thing I would have liked to see that we didn't. I love the the fan theory that uh, Sean Connery is still just playing James Bond. Honestly, he could definitely just be playing James Bond. I think it's a really fun way to watch the movie. It doesn't, it doesn't take anything away from anything and it kind of adds to like the imagination of it. Again, I like the Hans Zimmer score, but it is very similar to what he did in, in Twister. I think Um, this movie very much is the exact same plot as Armageddon, but they're both really fun. And I like both the films. However, um, I, I am doing my cage pairing, which is um, I want to recommend a movie to watch with this movie that does not uh, have Nick Cage in it. So I would think that watching Armageddon or Twister along with this movie would both be really great or maybe one of Sean Connery's Bond films. I've actually not seen any of them and nor do I care to, but I think any of those would be a really, really fun double feature. This movie is just action-packed and so fun. It is the first of seven films that Nick Cage did with Jerry Brockheimer. Um, And I I like all of them. I've actually not seen one of them. So, okay, of the ones I have seen, I like. He did this. He did um, Gone in 60 Seconds. Sorcerer's Apprentice, National Treasure 1 and 2, and a film called G-Force, as well as um, Con Air. Uh, So those are the Jerry Brockheimer, Nick Cage collections. Uh, Jerry Brockheimer is an interesting producer. Um, Michael Bay is an interesting director. The triple feature of The Rock, Twister, and Armageddon absolutely would be, I don't know, would that be too much? I wouldn't watch in that order. I would do Twister, The Rock, Armageddon, I think. Um, I think that would be a great triple feature and really fun. Like, what a day. Like, that's a that's a popcorn day. Those are popcorn movies. If the, any movie is a popcorn movie, it's those three movies. Um, but I think out of all, all of the Michael Bay movies, I think The Rock is absolutely bape action. It's his, it's, I think, his best movie. And I, I probably like a lot more Michael Bay movies than most people. Um, yes, 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 yes. Uh, So that's really what I wanted to talk about predominantly. I guess I should talk a little more more about Nick Cage's performance. Um, Nick Cage really goes into most of his movies with like, um, he really likes to explore characters. I think he was 32 when they made this movie. Um, This is what started the Nick Cage action songs, the action renaissance. He did this movie right after... He had done uh, Leaving Las Vegas, which is what he won his Academy Award for. And then after this, he did a lot of really big action pack, like blockbuster type movies. Um, I think generally speaking, a lot of people do really like The Rock. And if you think of Nick Cage, this is probably one of the first movies most people think of when they think of it or when they think of him. This character is one where he does have some kind of like big explosions but you don't really think of them like that because you totally understand why he'd be stressed he's not acting in a way that isn't totally different than anyone else in the film so whether it be you know in context or out of context i don't think there's anything you know very explosive (laughs) a movie about rockets being not explosive that was a poor choice of words, but you know what I mean? Where there are a lot of movies where people clip things out where Nick Cage is doing something and out of context, it doesn't make sense. I think everything in and out of context does make sense. Um, yes, definitely. This film is pure nineties. Like you could, the nineties radiates off of this film in a way that very few films do this and slackers. <laughs> um, it's, it's his character is, I feel like unlike most characters he plays, except for another movie uh, produced by Brockheimer, National Treasure. I think Stanley Goodspeed and his character Ben Gates in National Treasure would, you could, there's a clear thorough line between those characters, um, except he's a bit more subdued. And maybe that has to do with him being a bit older when he made that movie. I don't know. 
But yeah, this movie is really fun. I would absolutely recommend it. It's it's great action 90s ridiculousness. Again, Bay action. Um, thank you very much for watching or listening. Um, you can catch me. Uh, I do this show live on YouTube whenever I have the time on the Rob Fishbeck Network. Or obviously, if you're listening in um, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, you could follow me or find me on Instagram at Cage Unleashed. Um, or you can follow me on YouTube at Legoland13, which is L-E-G-A-U-L-T-L-A-N-D-1-3. Um, I have some other things I do on um, PLD projects. We do a show called Reviewed on the Rob Fishbeck Network. I'm on a show called Characters of Culture. Um, and then I also have another Instagram account where I talk about horror movies called Horror Explorer, which is H-O-R-R-O-R-E-X-P-L-E. O R O R. And I think that about sums up all the places you can find me if you're interested. Um, comments are welcome. And yes, that will be all. Thank you so much for watching or listening. And have a cagey day. If you cage that all.